So I love that reading from Ben Sirach. And if you were trying to find it in your pew Bible, you would not find it there because the Apocrypha is mostly used by our Catholic brothers and sisters. We had another reading from the Apocrypha a few weeks ago, which was from the book of Ecclesiastes, not Ecclesiastes. And it was in the program, right? But in the script for our lay leader, I put the spelling of the other book. So I had a lot of people on the way out telling me that there was no 14th and 15th chapter of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Sometimes the Apocrypha says things that sum up parts of the Bible in ways that take a lot of different pieces and pull them together from us. That is one of my favorite scriptures because it talks so much about what friendship truly is. When I was a child, every single friend I had went to church with me. We didn't have family nearby, so the people in my church became like brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, and yes, even kissing cousins. Looking back now, I realize we were all so much alike. We read the same books, Laura Ingalls Wilder and the Bible. We ate the same food, Colonel Sanders fried chicken during the week and Sunday roast that cooked all morning while we were at church. We wore the same clothes, cute little two-piece suits that we wore for skiing and swimming on the river and proper one-piece bathing suits that covered up as much of our body as possible for church camp. I learned one year that you can find a bathing suit with a turtleneck. My mother insisted I buy it. We listened to the same music. We went to the same movies. We drove the same cars. And our parents voted for the same person for president. It was homogeneity at its highest level. And I was safe and loved and I didn't really know anything else. But my mother knew there were other worlds. So when she put our hair up in rollers, some of you don't even know what those are, on Saturday morning, she had us read to her from the Encyclopedia Britannica, the ones that she had bought from the salesman that came to our front door one hot summer afternoon. She would let us choose the volume, with whatever letter was our favorite at the moment. When we traveled, she took us to art museums and natural history museums, and we never in my childhood missed a World's Fair that was in the United States. Seattle in 62, New York in 64, San Antonio in 68, and Spokane in 74. She wanted us to see the world and its diversity, even though we lived in a very structured white box. She also took us to special services. On Sunday afternoons at the Black Baptist Church on the east side of town, often my mother was invited to sing at those services. And while she sang beautifully at our all white Baptist church on the west side of town, I would watch my mother be transformed when she was singing at Miss Carey's church. Ethel Waters, the great performer who sang for Billy Graham revivals towards the end of her career, was the musician my mother most admired and longed to be like. I remember waking up to the sounds of Miss Waters' beautiful voice serenading us as her records played on the stereo in our living room. And if I had my mother's talent, I would share a few bars of those songs with you, but I don't. And yet they are still embedded to this day on my heart. The people my mother loved most in the world were black and brown and white. And she tried very hard in the midst of a racist society to teach us that friendships came in all shapes and sizes and colors. She was a child of the South who somehow went against the way she was raised and found a way to open her heart. And when she did, 
she came to realize her soul depended on the friendships of people that were not just like her. I think many of you, just like me, have in the last week been overwhelmed by the enormity of the hatred and the bigotry in our country. After the election last fall, I was as close to entering into a deep situational depress depression as I have ever been in my life. But this spring and early this summer, even in the midst of all that plagues our country and our world, I finally felt like I was hitting my stride again. And then last weekend, Charlottesville. And the sad part is, I act like it's something new. People of color, Jews, Muslims, gays, lesbians, people of all gender identities have been living Charlottesville for a very long time. I'm hopeful this morning that all of you, just like me, don't want to live in this kind of world, this kind of country. Because whether you grew up without the father who died on the battlefield fighting the Nazis in World War II, or whether you have suffered under the old Jim Crow laws or the new Jim Crow that threatens to destroy our society, or if your family or your partner's family lost people in the concentration camps or on the killing fields, or if you find yourself constantly afraid that the marriage you fought so hard to have legally might be taken away, then as funny as it was, we can't all stay home and eat cake with Tina Fey on Saturday night. We're going to have to find a way to stand against what's happening. As I have grieved over these events and the people whose lives are in the firing lines of the hatred, I keep wondering, what is mine to do? What am I supposed to stand up for and where do I need to get out of the way? I wish there was a clear-cut path. I wish someone would just tell me what to do. But it's not that easy. My mind, though, keeps coming back to an idea, as simple as it is, that friendship might well be one important key to moving forward. You may have all the friends you need. Maybe you have 5,000 friends on Facebook and you're still in touch with all of your friends from college and you get together at least once a year with the girl that lived across the street from you when you were five years old. You may be that person. But even if you are, I think it's time to find some new friends. And not just any old friends, but friends who might not look like you and might not sound like you or have the same theology and faith you do. Maybe it's time for you to begin reaching out and developing those friendships that have the possibility of changing your life. Ever since I came to Los Angeles, I've been wishing for those friendships. And quite honestly, it's been hard. Hard to break into even the most progressive groups you can imagine. So I'm beginning to think I just may have to start my own circles. I began thinking about this a few weeks ago Late one afternoon at my Starbucks behind the church, I had coffee with someone I met recently. In the midst of our conversation, she told me that even though she has a great many friends in L.A., she finds herself longing for some of those life-changing friends, the ones who can sit and have deep conversations. Deep conversations. I cannot get that thought out of my mind. Maybe it's my age. Perhaps it's that we've moved so many times over the past 30 years. Whatever it may be, I am at a place where I'm thirsting for deep conversations. The ones where you forget what time it is. The ones where you listen to each other's stories without interrupting. 
the ones that touch our souls and stretch our minds and prod our conscience, the ones that go beyond superficial to meaningful. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the great philosopher from France and Jesuit priest said, the universe will be unified only through personal relationships. It will become one only under the influence of love and friendship. Perhaps then our personal and our collective wholeness is dependent on understanding the sacred stories that engage not only our minds but also our hearts. And perhaps it is through these friendships that we will be able to understand our journeys, our story, in the greater story of a world that God filled with diversity. I'm dreaming these days of a church that provides opportunities for us to create relationships that count for something, rather than wandering from one social event to another. We find ourselves in those kind of relationships everywhere and anywhere. So if we want to make a difference in our world, if we want to make a difference in our city right now, we need to find and become the kind of friends who demand more of us. Or as Sister Joan Chichester says, friendships that are more than continual immersion in the mundane. In a few weeks, we will begin a new season in the life of our church, a season where we pray that the deepness of our community will grow and flourish. I believe in the months ahead, we are going to reach out across these aisles and find new friends. Friends who will speak to the best parts of us from the best parts of themselves. To do this, we will need to actively seek out those who are different from us, those who have something to say that we have never heard before. And of course, we'll have to learn to listen to each other so that we can hone our best intentions, so that we can challenge our least profound assumptions, so that we can point out directions that take us to higher levels of thought and care and determination. Sister Joan says, when life is most unclear, most confusing, we need this quality of friendship. So she says, first, we must become aware of our own limitations and how little we really know of each other. And then we must open our hearts to what others can teach us. Only then will we be ready for what is next. I often find myself these days longing to go back to that living room of that red brick rancher on Sylvester Street in Pasco, Washington, and get a volume of that encyclopedia off the shelf and try and find a way back to that safe space. I fear, though, my mother would tell me, get over it. I can hear her saying, lovely dream, Laura, but this isn't La La Land even if you do live in L.A. I hear that track of her saying that a lot these days. I think she would say to me, it's your turn. It's your turn to stand up against what's wrong, but don't think you can do it by yourself. You had better find some friends to travel this road with you. I love you, friends, and I pray that this may be so for all of us. Amen.